All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta, and today I'm here with my colleague. Ray Alvarez, I'm, uh, I work with AWS. I'm a specialist container solutions architect. Fantastic, I am a principal open source technologist. Uh, I'm also the CNCF board representative for Amazon. So today we will talk about debug your Kubernetes applications. Um, just like anybody, we have a Twitter handle and we both work for AWS. I know this is KubeCon, but you know, when we talk to customers about containerizing, modernizing their application, we always ask them why they want to use Kubernetes. Most of the time, Kubernetes ends up being the answer, but we want to emphasize the fact that Kubernetes is not a golden hammer. It may not be the solution of every problem that you're looking for. We hope it is, but it's not the case. So make sure you are looking to solve the pain points, the problems that your customers are facing, and then applying Kubernetes to solve those problems. Another principle that I really found recently, I really uh, connect with it, that the more you think you know about Kubernetes, the less you think you know. You know? I mean, every time you, know, you start peeling the onion, you know, it's more tears coming out of your eyes. So the um, important part is to understand, you know, we will see that in the presentation. This presentation is all about the different ways your apps can fail and how do you recover from that, essentially. So in this talk, what we intend to cover is um, several aspects here. Um, we put asterisks on the last two topics because we think, just like Kubernetes, we are oversubscribed. Um, hopefully we can cover all the topics here. Uh, so starting with cluster design, what are the basics, what are the errors that we are seeing with our customers over there, networking, kubectl CLI, uh, pods. So we'll talk about every places you know, where there are errors happening in these areas and how we can help debug those. Load balancing, ingress, monitoring, and then time permitted, we'll look at resource uh, reservation and stateful sets as well. So let's get started by cluster design. You know, um, before we even jump there, I want to get the basic concepts out there that when we are looking at customers and how are they designing their cluster, what are the basic principles that they need to think about? Oh, one thing I have to remember is go down here. All right. So let's talk about the core Kubernetes components. At a very high level, if you think about a cluster setup, you, know, you want to create a highly available cluster. So at, in Amazon language, we have this concept of a region which is a physical location around the world where we cluster data centers. And in a region, we have multiple availability zones. These availability zones are far separated from each other for HA and disaster recovery. So what you're showing here is how do you set up a Kubernetes cluster in a region spread across multiple availability zones. So in terms of Kubernetes components, what you have is really a controller. And there are a bunch of controllers over there which we'll dig a little bit into deeper into it. Then HCD is where your state of the cluster is persisted down there. And then you have worker nodes, which is where basically all of your containers are running essentially. So in terms of setting up a cluster, you want to make sure that your controllers, HCD, and workers are spread across multiple availability zones. That gives you the basic principle of HA, not a single point of failure. You know, Yes, region is basically where you're deploying it, but there are strategies around that. But essentially what you're doing is you're spreading your workload across multiple availability zones in case one availability zone goes down for whatever reason, geographical disaster, whatever it is, okay? So that's the key component that you want to understand here. So how do you set up a Kubernetes cluster? Uh, first step is to really create your controller. And when we are talking about controller, we're really talking about um, scheduler controller, deployment set controller, replica set controller, all of those controllers that need to run together Together, let's call them as master, basically. So you create a controller node that is typically called as control plane. Then you need to set up HCD. Um, and the decision that you need to make over there is, will HCD be co-located with your master, or will it be running on a separate node? At Amazon, we prefer that it runs on a separate node, because again, you know, it allows you to reduce your blast radius and allows you to upgrade HCD by itself as well. And also, the needs for your controller, which is more CPU bound, as opposed to HCD, which is more disk bound, you can set up the right EC2 instance types accordingly. Then you have kubectl CLI, of course, by the way, which you connect to your Kubernetes cluster or to the control plane. So that is your control plane, essentially. And the only way you can talk to your cluster is using kubectl and directly talking to the control plane. Then you install your worker nodes. And the worker nodes is basically you know, all of your EC2 instances where your containers, pods, deployments, et cetera, are going to run. So you have your control plane, then you have a data plane, and you attach that data plane to the control plane. And then you deploy your apps, 
your add-ons, whatever functionality you want on top of that Kubernetes cluster using kubectl. Very simple process, but devil is in the details, and that's where things start breaking apart. Hopefully you're making profit out of that application. And go back to the first slide. Remember, what is the pain point? What is the application that, that you're trying to deploy over there? How are you trying to solve that problem? It should be in your mind. This is just a process, as I was saying in the morning, is not the destination. It is a car to the destination. So remember the destination in the mind. When you're designing your Kubernetes cluster, there are a lot of considerations that needs to go into uh, in your mind. Should I use control plane, self-manage, or should I manage the cluster by myself? When I'm designing the controller nodes, what kind of EC2 instance type? And I'm just using AWS terminology, but these are applicable to across the clouds. What kind of EC2 instance type should I use? Um, what if my number of pods on my worker nodes increase? How should I scale my data plane? How should I size my HCD? Securing my HCD, backing up my HCD, setting up a raft consensus protocol. Day one is OK. You know, I've got a Hello World application up and running. What about my day two? Upgrades, patches, CVEs. Who's going to do all that? Is that my core competency? Always think about that part of it. Or you have the capability. Or is this a morale booster that something goes on your resume? Hey, I'm a Kubernetes SRE. So think about what is the motivation over there. It's OK to have that on a resume, by the way. But some of the design considerations, and again, these are very basic design considerations that you need to look at when you are designing your own Kubernetes cluster. That's where you know, we created Amazon EKS. Amazon EKS is Amazon's version of a managed Kubernetes service. And essentially, what we give you is a managed control plane. And in that control plane, you don't need to worry about it. What is the EC2 instance type? How often HCD is backed up? How is it going to be HA? All of those are given to you by default. And on Monday, actually of this week, we announced something called as managed nodes. But what that means is the full cluster, if you want it, including the control plane and the data plane, is fully managed for you. So that capability now exists in Amazon EKS. But if you want to bring your own custom uh, worker nodes, you can totally do that. Because that's, that's how we, were init we initially launched, essentially. Okay? So think in terms of when you're designing your Kubernetes cluster, is it HA, is it DR, security, backup, Hum, what kind of instance type, upgrades, and all that capabilities. Now, you look, up, look at the concept of kubectl. As we talked about it, so your cluster is created, so you take your kubectl, and that's how you talk to your cluster, and then the cluster is really what is deploying, or the API server, essentially, which is listening to all those requests from kubectl, understands those requests, and then deploy your objects into the data plane over here, okay? So that's, kubectl is basically one CLI that manages your Kubernetes cluster. Let's look a little bit more into the Kubernetes cluster design so that we understand which, what are the things that can potentially break, and soon we will start getting into the real um, deal over there. But if you think about the master node components, the first one is an API server, which is sort of, uh, you know, because if you think about Kubernetes is nothing but a REST endpoint. It listens to REST API that is being sent from a kubectl essentially, so there is an API server that needs to be set there. Then there is a controller manager. As we talked about earlier, deployment set controller, replica controller, uh, replica set controller, uh, persistent set controller, you name it. All of these different controllers are existing, and at a given point of time when the request is received, they make sure that the desired and the actual state are reconciled, essentially. So that's what they take care of. Then there is scheduler, which is also a controller. So after all the state is persisted into HCD, the scheduler kicks in, and the scheduler says, okay, here is a part that is not being assigned to a node. Let me rank all the worker nodes that are available based upon my predefined algorithm, or if you are giving me a custom algorithm, I'm going to pick a worker node, I'm going to assign a part to that, and again, persist it into etcd as well. And then, of course, there is a etcd, which is sort of the back end on where the entire state of the cluster is persisted. So those are sort of the core master node components over here, and things can really break at all different levels over there. In terms of HCD design, you know, it follows the RAF consensus protocol. So once again, the recommendation over there is to have at least three HCD servers spread across multiple availability zones. So typically, you know, when the request comes into the Kube API server, it writes to the one HCD server, which is in the same availability zone, and then it replicates to other. It's eventually consistent. On the worker node component side, what we are looking at is there is kubelet that is sitting on each node. Think of it as a node agent, essentially. And that really handles the communication between the API server and the worker node. 
and that is the one that is really running your node and kind of communicating with the API server in terms of the status and the, what needs to be done and how many replicas, et cetera. Well, the replicas are designed by API server, but Kubelet is responsible for the life cycle of the container on the worker node. Then there is Kubeproxy, which is basically handles the communication between pods, nodes, and the outside world. And last but not the least, there is CRI, or Container Runtime Interface, or CRI, um, which basically says, okay, there are multiple ways by which the containers can be run. Um, I could use Docker, I could use ContainerD, I can use Cryo, uh, whatever technology. So kind of, it's a very Kubernetes-centric interface, but gives you the independence from what the underlying runtime technology could be. Now, in terms of creating a cluster, you know, um, the way we look at you know, creating an Amazon EKS cluster is very straightforward. Uh, EKS Cuttle is the official CLI, which is created by one of our partners, Weaveworks. So essentially what you say is EKS Cuttle create cluster. We were looking at the keynote this morning talking about convention over configuration, and this is exactly what it follows. The moment you say EKS Cuttle create cluster, it just has a whole bunch of defaults. What region, how many instance types, how many worker, what instance type, what is the army, all that defaults, and then it gives you a default EKS cluster. If you want to configure the cluster, if you want to create a cluster by your specific design, that I want to change you know, the number of nodes, the instance type, or the SSH keys, or uh, what kind of uh, logging property, properties it has, sure, you can specify them on the CLI, but you can also specify them in a configuration file. So following the practices of how you create your EKS cluster persisted into the database, persisted into the GitHub repo. So essentially what you can do is you can create like a configuration file, and in the configuration file, for example, in this case I'm saying my cluster name is debug gates, and now it's in the region US East 1, then I'm specifying a node group, and the node group has um, M5 extra large instance type, and I'm creating a four node cluster. I'm also enabling SSH, and I'm saying use my US East 1 key, so essentially that's, that's all. And then the last fragment is where I'm saying, enable these kind of logging. So my um, control plane logging is already available. That is the most useful, useful tool typically when you get to when things go wrong. So it's very important to enable those kind of logging over there. Thanks, Arun. So let's look at networking. And when Arun reached out to me and said, we need to do this presentation, and we need to find out all the ways Kubernetes clusters have failed on AWS. I reached out to a few friends inside Amazon and asked, started asking them questions like, what do you think are the number one issues that customers run into? And unanimously, everyone came to me with the same response that the number one problem on Kubernetes is generally related to network. So there are two core components that we're, we are looking at when it comes to networking problems. The first one is the CNI. Now, in Kubernetes, Kubernetes does not provide its own uh, networking stack. You can bring in your own network provider. Um, some have some functionalities, like network policies. And on EKS, we are using the Amazon VPC CNI, which gives you the ability to, uh, to give your pods a VPC IP address. And the next thing uh, was core DNS. A lot of work has been uh, implemented in core DNS in the last few months, in the last few releases since uh, it became standard in, in 1.11. So a lot of improvement has already happened, but when you're running clusters that include thousands of pods or hundreds of nodes, it does not scale automatically, and there are certain steps that you need to do. So we're gonna take a look at some of those use cases today. So let's look at the CNI. What is CNI? CNI is a container networking interface, and on EKS, uh, we use Amazon VPC CNI by default, and that gives you the ability to give your pods and your worker nodes the same IP address from a subnet within your VPC. And if you've ever used COPS or any other thing, you, you might be familiar with things like Calico or Flannel or Canal. These are overlay networking technologies that include a little bit of overhead, the compute overhead, to run on the worker nodes, but also now you have to deal with another layer of IP addressing that you don't have to deal with in Amazon VPC CNI because what the IPs that you're seeing for pods and your worker nodes are real VPC IP address. You can ping them, you can connect directly to them, and you can do things like VPC flow logs, et cetera. So if you look at how the CNI works in, um, in EKS, uh, 
CNI basically uses Elastic Network Interface, which is a, a network interface that you attach or it's automatically attached to an EC2 instance. And that's basically providing the networking capabilities of each EC2 instance, and that's how you connect your network. So each e EC2 instance gets an ENI attached to it. And Amazon VPC CNI runs on top of ENI. What that means is it uses ENIs to give IP addresses to pods and EC2 instances. Um, one of the IP addresses that you have in uh, ENI is reserved for communication. So typically, you sh the max number you see, deduct one, because that's what you're using for communication back and forth with VPC. Um, pods, as I said, receive an IP address directly from the subnet. So that means that you now have a limitation of the total number of pods that you can have in your cluster. First limitation is the size of the subnet. So if you have uh, only 100 IPs in, the, in that subnet, guess what? You can only create 100 pods. Anything that, any pod that's created after that is going to remain in pending state unless you, have, unless you add more IP address or um, increase the instance size. So you should really pay attention and plan for growth before you're starting your cluster. Make sure that you get a, 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 an idea about what is going to be that upper lim limit for your pods, and then create a network accordingly. So let's see. Uh, we create a deployment. This is a, a very uh, highly sophisticated application that I've written, and it's a very highly sophisticated output. It says, hello world to the world. Uh, I'm very proud of it. And I, I want to run it. So I basically go to, uh, go to Kubernetes and say, kubectl, create my deployment, which is a hello world application. But of course, I, since this is such a high transaction, very, very important application, I have to make sure that it runs at scale. So what I did was I said, scale my replica to 240. Let's see how is the performance of print hello world uh, at 240 replicas. So I was very proud that it's going to work, and then this happened. I went to, say, get deployments, and I, I was ver very happy that 222 of them were adopted, but the remaining were orphans or pending states. So I got very curious. I'm one of those users that learns by actually doing. So when the idea comes to my head, I directly go into doing without skipping the very, very low importance uh, task of reading documentation. So I, you know, Kubernetes works, and I just will go ahead and scale it to millions on unlimited scaling, and I, I, will, I should have that, but it didn't happen. I only have 222 pods. What went wrong? So I try to get, get pods, and it seems like some of the pods may be in pending state. So here's another cool thing. Uh, if you don't know about field selectors, these are really important, especially when your cluster becomes larger and you may be running hundreds or even thousands of pods, field selectors really come into play and you can filter them. So over here, I'm just doing a, uh, give me all the pods that are pending, and I see a bunch of them are pending. So I want to troubleshoot a little bit more. Um, now, this time I can use get events. kubectl get events is going to give you all the events in the cluster, uh, but over here, I'm not interested in anything that may be information only, so I'm only looking at warning. And if I dig a little bit deeper into it, I'm shown something that looks like this. And I see that there's an interesting pod. That's the pod I'm interested in, my Hello World application. And I see that it says, fail to assign IP address to container. So that's the number one issue people run into, because guess what? I did not read documentation, and Kubernetes was supposed to solve world hunger, and yet here it is. It can't even create my 240 pods. So I want to take a look into it, and I then started reading documentation, because that's what you're supposed to do. You work first, fail, and then read documentation. So I looked at this nifty component of the CNI, and it's called IPAMD, um, and it basically does two things. First of all, it maintains a warm pool of IP address from the VPC, so it, let's say it will cache uh, 10, 15, 20 IP addresses, and as pods are created, it's going to assign an IP address to each one of them, and as pods get destroyed, it's going to then take that IP address and keep it in this warm pool. Um, so I, as, I, as you mentioned, ENI uh, basically uses one IP address for communication. So the max number of, I, max number of IPs I can get in, a, in an EC2 instance, there's a simple formula for that. Um, I don't know if you guys can read it. So the, the formula really is you take the, the number of ENIs times that by the IP addresses that, each EN, that ENI supports, minus one, 
because that's the one it uses to communicate back. Um, and the, the number of IP address that you can get on that, that EC2 instance is going to be a min function, so whichever is smaller, that's going to be a limiting factor. So in my cluster here, I have an M5X large EC2 instance type, and it can support up to four ENIs, and each ENI supports 15 IP addresses. Yes? Oh, increase the font. That could be a challenge. We've never done that. I don't know what else is going to break. <laughs> yes. This is better than Hello World. <laughs> so I have an M5X large cluster, four ENIs, 15 IP addresses. I'm really bad at math. So don't let me do this here. Yes, 56 was the number I was trying to get to. So it can support up to 56 um, IP address, where four times 15, uh, you get it. Um, so that's a 56 is the, is the maximum ENI that it can support. The default uh, cluster that I created in the default subnet, it supports up to 8,192 IP address. It's a slash 19. I knew it, didn't need to read it, because uh, that's how I s calculate ciders. So what the maximum number of pods that I can uh, run on this EC2 instance is going to be directly related to the maximum of IPs that I get uh, on this EC2 instance. So over here, my limit is going to be 56, um, and 56 is the max number of pods that I can run inside this EC2 instance. One recommendation at 116 is that you should not run any uh, more than 100 pods per node, um, and if you want to know why, click on that link. Uh, it should tell you exactly why. So. In, in this situation, I have four EC2 instances, uh, four M5X larges, so uh, that means that 56 times four is going to be 240. Is it going to be 224? 224. 224, and that's why my pods stopped at 220. Um, why did they stop at 220? Because I may be running other pods that are also consuming IP address. So that's the number one thing to keep in mind, is that you always want to make sure that you are planning ahead, you have enough IP addresses, because if you don't, uh, your application scaling is at, at one point going to come to a halt, um, and your, your cluster will break, your apps won't scale. So in order to do that, we've created the CNI Metrics Helper open source tool, and it is a very easy tool that you can deploy inside your cluster, and it can report back metrics like what is the number of IP addresses available or are there any errors in my cluster. So let's take a look at deploying that, very simple. First of all, I'm going to create a policy. This IAM policy is basically going to allow whoever assumes this role to write to CloudWatch directly. So I will write this policy. The next thing I'm going to do is attach that to an EC2 instance, which is my M5XL in this situation. Um, you can alternatively also use what we released recently, uh, I am uh, mapping to a service account, and you could do that too. Um, the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this uh, YAML file, which is going to create a bunch of resources inside your cluster. Uh, but the most in in interesting thing is that it's, it creates a pod inside your Coop system namespace, which is CNI Metrics Helper. And this Metrics Helper is collecting information and then providing that to you on CloudWatch. So, uh, once I deploy this, I can go to my CloudWatch and I can really quickly look at uh, how many IP addresses I have available and, uh, and how many IPs are in use. I can create some, some really nice uh, alerts to send me a Slack message in the middle of the night that you're running out of IP addresses. All right, so let's look at core DNS. Now, this was the number two thing that, that people told me customers run into. So let's look at core DNS. Um, core DNS use was, before core DNS came in, we had cube DNS. Uh, core DNS was uh, G8 and 1.11, so if you have clusters that you created uh, that are 1.11 and you long forgot about it, then you should switch to core DNS. But if you created clusters after 1.11, by default you're getting core DNS. And so core DNS is highly scalable, highly customizable DNS provider for Kubernetes. And it uses a core file to control, it's basically the configuration for, for core DNS. And the core file is stored in a config map, like all good apps do. Uh, and it's stored in a core DNS config map, which you can directly manipulate. So if, my, my, if I'm facing some problems with DNS resolution in my cluster, the first thing I will do 
is go look at your pods, go look at your core DNS pods. So in EKS, by default, we'll run two replicas of uh, core DNS deployment. In your situation, maybe one, maybe three, we recommend that you run at least two at a time. If your pods are running and you're still not able to uh, get name resolution or you have latency, the next thing I would do is check your service. So there's a core DNS service that you can um, look into and make sure that it's up and running. If that doesn't work, you can then add logging to your core DNS. And here, well, I'm going to just edit um, my core DNS config map, and I've added this. Uh, you guys see this? This. Yes, that one. <laughs> uh, you just add a log there, and it will automatically then start pu publishing logs, pushing out logs. You can then do kubectl logs, get in, look at each pod, and look at all, all the outputs of each pod. Or, um, sorry about that. Or you can just uh, run this command, which is uh, it basically gets all the pods in, in, that are called core DNS, and it will show you an output of all the, all the pods that are running inside your cluster. So this is generally where you, want, you will find that most of the problems can be, can be tapped into, and you can then act upon it. Uh, some of the ways of fixing these problems, uh, num what first way is the easiest way to just scale your replicas, and you can scale them to three, four, five, but sometimes that still doesn't help. Uh, so for that, the, the second option is a local DNS add-on that uh, Core DNS has, and it creates a daemon set that runs on each uh, worker node, and all the queries that come from any of those pods are then sent to this local uh, daemon set which enables faster name resolution. The next thing is the memory requirements for core DNS. So core DNS uh, comes with some same defaults. So in EKS, we've, uh, we say that at minimum, core DNS should have a 70 MIB uh, request, and we cap it to 170 MIBs. But you c if you're running a larger cluster, if you're running hundreds of, uh, and thousands of pods, then you should change it, and the calculation is pretty simple, pods plus services by 1,000 plus 54. Um, and some of you may be thinking, why 54? Well, 54 comes from 19 meg is what uh, the core DNS application needs, and then 19, um, and then 30 megs for uh, caching, and then five megs for buffer. So that comes out to be 54. That's the default, that's a recommendation. In EKS, you will be using 70, but if you are running large cluster, you might want to um, you might want to customize this number. Uh, another plugin is the AutoPath plugin. AutoPath plugin has some improvements that can improve uh, name resolutions for names that are external to your cluster. Now, I wouldn't recommend uh, recommend this enabling by default unless you're running into this problem of external name resolution. Sometimes. With AutoPath plugin, the increase could be tenfold. So it's really important if you have that uh, requirement in your cluster. But the downside is that now you have significantly more memory that your core DNS pods need. So instead of pods plus services by 1,000, over here you're dividing that by 250. So four times uh, uh, more memory requirement with AutoPath. So that's uh, the networking section. I'll give you back. I'm not done yet. We're not done. We're not done yet. No worries. All right, kubectl. So kubectl is the primary way by which we interact with the Kubernetes cluster. How does kubectl work? So let's try to understand the basic concept behind kubectl. Well, of course, you need a kubeconfig file. You know, that's sort of the way it looks at it. And the default location for kubeconfig is in your home directory, in a .cube directory, in config. And that's where your configuration lives. And what can happen over there is, you know, in that configuration file, you potentially have multiple clusters that are configured, and for each cluster, there is a config section, and that you need to refer to. Uh, could be a local cluster, could be running on AWS, or any other cloud, or on-prem, whatever it is. Then you can use the command, say, kubectl config use context, specify the context that you want to use, and use that to talk to that particular cluster. So that's the way. Well, of course, you can always look at your kubeconfig environment variable, so oftentimes we have seen that, hey, you know what, I'm trying to connect to the Kubernetes cluster, but I'm not able to connect to the Kubernetes cluster. So the tip over there is make sure you don't have kubeconfig environment variable pointed to somewhere else. 
you know, because if that is pointed and you still have dot cube config, it doesn't matter. It's gonna take look look at the cube config environment variable. It basically communicates with the API server. Um, the, once the cube um, is configured, then it talks to the API server. All the commands are given over there. There's a beautiful post by somebody working at GitHub, you know, where it talks about how does kube cuddle really work? And I have a link uh, after, at the, I think, end of the end of the presentation. It talks about all the details. What happens when you say kube cuddle create dash f deployment? It's a long process. It's a lot of things that go behind the scenes. So if you look at it on the client side, for example, there is a client side validation that is happening. Then it infer your generators. Hey, by the way, you're trying to do a deployment. So I have a deployment generator because the deployment generator knows how to look at the deployment spec and create the rest representation of it. Then it creates a runtime object, and that runtime object is basically using that generator is gonna create your rest representation. Then it does the API version negotiation because you may be using a specific version of deployment, and then it says, hey, does your API server really provide that API version? And during the first run of you know, your kubectl by connecting to the API server, it downloads all the APIs you support and puts them into your local cache. So you can look at that, you know, if you go to into your cube config directory, there's a cache directory over there as well. So take a look at it. It kind of gives you the complete API versions that are supported over there, and that's what it refers to kind of for local optimization. Eventually, your REST request is created, so which is the REST request because end of the day, it's an API server. REST request is created, authentication is done, and the way authentication is done for EKS is a bit different, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But now the request is off to the API server. A lot more things happen on the server side, of course. You know, uh, authentication authorization happens. You're trying to create a deployment. Are you allowed to create a deployment? You're trying to delete a service, update a service. Are you allowed to do that? Um, then admission controllers get in, where it says, oh, by the way, um, if you're trying to create such a such deployment, how many resources are allowed, the namespaces, et cetera, what kicks in over there? Then it really deserializes the HTTP request, just the way there are generators, there are objects on the server side which deserialize the request and persist it into etcd. Initializers kick in, and then your controller kicks in. And all these controllers are doing is essentially the deployment set, replica set, the scheduler controller is, they're looking at your etcd state, and they say, oh, you want to create a deployment, so let me take a look at it, and deployment means you want to create a replica set. So I'm gonna create a replica set, persist that into etcd. Then the reply, replica set per, uh, controller gets up, says I'm gonna create a pod. So it persists the pod in etcd. Nothing has been created yet. This is the time when you're looking at your kubectl get pod, it says container creating. All this is happening behind the scene for you. Uh, then there's a kubelet which is sitting on your node, essentially, which is querying your API server every 20 seconds, looking for it, hey, you know what? Is there anything for me to deploy? Is there anything for me to deploy? Because that's where, you know, scheduler has already ranked your worker nodes, picked up where the pod needs to be deployed, and now the kubelet kicks in that, oh, there's a pod that is attached to me that's scheduled on me. It brings it up, identifies the CRI, and then, you know, it gets CRI is a Docker runtime, for example, then it uses CNI, gets an IP address, then it pulls the images and all those things, and then it eventually lays out all the file system on your local worker node, and then it says, hey, by the way, the container is up and running over here. So I just want to highlight the complexity of the process that goes behind this. Anything and everything can potentially break here. And that's where you will see different status, and we'll get into the pod lifecycle a bit later, but let's look, go a little bit further. So, one of the common errors that we have seen from our customers is they say, hey, you know what, I'm trying to do kubectl get service. And it's saying the server doesn't have a service type resource or resource type service. Service is a standard Kubernetes um, object. Why is it doesn't support it? The error is misleading. How often times, you know, you see a good error and say, oh, this is an excellent error, now I can debug it. So what's really happening here is you are at least in EKS case, your kubectl is not authorized to talk to Kubernetes cluster, okay? So the first tip that we always look at the users is, uh, you, you should look at, you know, what version of kubectl that, that you have. So say kubectl version, it gives you the kubectl version. And in Kubernetes, there is a capability, there is a, the amount of difference between kubectl CLI and the API server is predefined. So make sure you look at those API versions that, you know, they are in like not more than two versions apart. Then also update your AWS IAM authenticator. 
in AWS land, the security is all done using IAM, okay? So if you have just like a, you know, um, just a con cluster config over there, you can't directly talk to the cluster. I mean, that cluster config is generated by AWS CLI, then it's okay. But otherwise, the way it happens is, from kubectl, you know, there is an IAM role that you need to have. That IAM role, you know, behind the scene, kubectl invokes AWS IAM authenticator, which then talks to the SDS service, which gets a token, then it gets a token, and that token is then passed on to kubectl to go talk to the Kubernetes cluster behind the scene. So make sure your kubectl and AWS IAM authenticator is to the latest version. That's the typical source of error that we have seen. Oftentimes what we have seen is, you know, maybe your uh, config is not up to date because, hey, somebody else created a cluster and they did not give me a config or they gave me a config which is out of date. Now, if you have the AWS CLI, then of course you can use AWS EKS um, uh, command over there to create a cube config over there for you. You need to have the IAM role and the cluster endpoint. But once you have those data, then you can create your new cube config for you. Or if the cluster was created using EKS Cuttle, which we said is the official CLI, then EKS Cuttle also has a tool here. And the commands for generating your kube config file are specified over here. So for example, you could use AWS EKS update kube config. I know the command is update, but essentially it gives you a new kube config that you can talk to. So oftentimes what I would do is I would create this command, not generate this into my kube config file. I will generate it into a separate config file set up my kube config to that config file. Again, I'm trying to isolate the problem over here and then say, now go talk to the cluster. So can I help you debug your problem and isolate the issue? And then in case of EKS cuttle, then you can say EKS cuttle utils write kube config, give it the cluster name, and then it generates the configuration file. You have to specify the IAM role as well. Another um, thing that you want to look at is, is your cluster even accessible? So you can literally give the command curl-k HTTPS and the cluster API endpoint, and it shows you that, hey, this is what is available. Now, EKS cluster uses, I, I, we just said, it uses IAM authentication, essentially. So if you were to give this from your desktop, that will not work. So this command was really given from an EC2 instance that was set up in the VPC, the same VPC as the cluster was created. Because then you have the right privileges you know, to be able to talk to the API server endpoint. And then you will see this response. If you were to do this from your server, then you will actually get an uh, authorization um, error message that, hey, I can't talk to the server because, first of all, you're using HTTP, and the server has to be HTTPS. Even if you give it a HTTPS endpoint, it will not work. Um, so the way you know, this, would, this could work is potentially you could use like a AWS command to First of all, take the IAM token, EKS command. Say uh, there's an AWS EKS get token command to which you pass it an IAM role or arm of the IAM role. That'll get you a token. Then you use that token. Then you pass it on curl that, hey, use that token to make that request. Because end of the day, that's the token it's looking for when it's trying to do the authentication. And then your command will work. So my point is there are a lot of ways by which you can debug if your server is accessible or not. Another error, source of error that we have seen is um, somebody else created a cluster and uh, I'm using my IAM role and it's saying I'm not allowed to access the IAM role. So the way it looks at it is, is in the Kubernetes cluster, uh, we have a config map called as AWS auth config map. And in the config map, the users and the roles that are allowed to talk to the cluster and at what different RBAC capabilities are listed over there. So what you want to do is check with your admin or the person who created the cluster that, hey, does my role or the IAM really exist in the auth config map as well? And if not, then you want to get it added over there, actually. So if you look at it at the bottom of the screen, there is a map roles and map users. So make sure you are um, added right over there. Now you may wonder this is not the right ARN format. Uh, it should be ARN colon, I, colon, colon IAM, but the colon colon was kind of messing up our formatting. But make sure this is not syntactically valid, but that's what it's supposed to be. So um, again, as I said, you know, if you're not part of the AWS auth config map, then you will say, hey, you, know, you must be logged into the server. So you are unauthorized, and it would not let you communicate with the server. So in this case, you know, what you've done is you get your on added to the AWS auth config map, and voila, you know, your kubectl works. And then you can say kubectl version. It'll give you the client version, the server version, 
or you can use kubectl uh, cluster info. Then it gives you the server endpoint and a lot more details about it. You can get the component status, and it gives you scheduler, controller manager, etcd status, all that. So all those good things come along to you. Something else we have seen is that, hey, I'm trying to do kubectl get nodes. It's not even showing me the nodes. Um, this is one of the capabilities that is there as, again, I'm using Amazon EKS as an example over here, but make sure your API endpoint is publicly accessible. Because oftentimes our customers ask that, I don't want my API server endpoint to be publicly accessible. I only want it to be accessible from within the VPC. So um, this is a, a snapshot of the AWS console. So you can take a look at it. At the bottom, it says public access is disabled. So you need to select enable, and then the public endpoint or the API server endpoint is accessible publicly, and then you can talk to it from your desktop, essentially. So that's an important aspect. So some of the ways by which you need to look at you know, what is happening in terms of kubectl to get work or to just be able to talk to the server. Because if that's not working, then no pods are going to get deployed over there at all. And I'm doing this one as well. All right. Pods. All this work, all this creation of cluster, all this kubectl to work, all this networking to work is to get that one pod running. Let's look at pods. So in terms of pod life cycle, there's a, I mean, Kubernetes documentation is awesome. So it very clearly explains what are the different phases of pods and what are the meanings of that. So I'm not going to get into the details of it. But essentially, uh, pending, running, succeeded, failed, and unknown are the five stages. Uh, the only happy stages are running and succeeded. Uh, that means you know that the pod is running well. And even in running, depending upon how many containers are in the pod, it'll tell you one out of one, two out of two, or one out of two. So you want to pay close attention to those numbers. Um, because if it's one out of two, then one container in that pod is not running. You want to make sure it is x out of x. You know, it should not be x out of y, where x and y are different numbers. Succeeded means you, know, you are probably running a job, um, and then the job has completed and is succeeded, so that's good as well. Uh, pending, we talked about some of the reasons you know, why it could happen. I'll dig a little bit de de uh, deeper into that. Unknown typically happens when the kubelet is not able to communicate uh, with the server. Um, uh, network partition, multiple reasons that could happen. And failed is, again, could be the reason where uh, we have seen most commonly happening when you're not able to pull the image, for example. And that's where uh, it starts failing. So then again, you kind of look at the details of the pod that, hey, give me more details. And it tells you that, oh, the image not found, and all those error messages start showing up for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the fantastic Hello deployment that you created, and we're going to create eight, eight replicas of that. So I just created a simple deployment here. Or we scale an existing deployment to eight replicas. And I see that only four replicas are available. Okay, So again, not a happy use case. So let's take a little bit more detail on why pod could be pending and what are the things that we could do basically for, to work around that. Now, <clears throat> when I look at, say, um, list pods, and I say kubectl get pods, it says, yeah, sure, four pods are pending. What are some of the reasons why the pods may be pending? <clears throat> the most common reason is not enough resources in the cluster. Um, on a pod, you can specify resource, limit, port, um, and resource limit could be for CPU, memory. So there is most like, the most common reason is there's not enough of those resources in the cluster. Okay, so that's one part of it. Um, something that Ray already co covered is you know, not enough IP addresses in the cluster. Because the way we allocate IP addresses is uh, each ENI can give you a certain number of IP addresses, and you do that sophisticated math formula. And then you say, hey, these are the only IP addresses available, so you need to kind of scale your cluster if you want to run a certain number of pods. Okay? Um, you also want to ensure that your all nodes are healthy. So maybe you think you have a four-node cluster, but really what you have is a two-node cluster, and the other nodes are not getting recycled for some reason. So make sure that their health is looking good. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say describe a pod. I'm going to take a look at the one specific pod that was not healthy. So I'm looking at it. It says failed scheduling is the reason for that. And it says zero out of four nodes are available, insufficient CPU. As I said, on a pod, you can define resources, uh, limit, um, resources and limits. 
and those are for CPU and memory by default, and we'll get into those, those part of it actually next. Um, so the important part here is these events, even though I created a deployment, these events are only available on pods, not on deployments, replica set, or job. Because end of the day, they are creating a pod, so you really need to say, describe that pod, and then you'll get all the details about it, okay? So now what I'm doing is, okay, get me all the events, and we looked at that detail already. It says all the events that I'm getting is zero out of four nodes are available, so there is not sufficient CPU available for me. Now I wanna only get warning events, that's important, and again, we looked at it earlier. Uh, we also looked at, say, field selector. Um, one of the things I also wanna highlight is I can actually get involved object dot name. So now I'm actually specifying the specific pod name here that show me all the events, warning events for this pod. Simple tips, I think, you know, which can hopefully will go a long way in kind of debugging your problem. And again, we are purely using kubectl. We are not even gone into any of the system tools yet. Another tool that we have found handy is, again, kubectl get events, show me, you know, list sorted by timestamp. So I want to look at the recent event, you know, last five, last 10, last 20, whatever that number is, you can start specifying that, okay? So let's look at you know, the memory and CPU requirements. What is the reason that my pod may not be running? So now if I look at the describe deployment slash hello, it says, sure, it is a Nginx latest image that I'm trying to deploy over there. But if I look at the limits, it says uh, two CPUs um, as the limit and two gigabyte as the memory. And similarly, the request is two and memory is two. A fundamental concept that you want to understand over here is request is what it will initially get and limit is the maximum value that it will go to. Okay, so that's the way you want to think about it. So essentially what I'm looking at here is um, I need, if I'm doing eight replicas of the pod, then I need a whole bunch of memory. You know? So I'm, essentially I'm looking at 16 CPUs and I'm looking at about 16 gigabyte. Hey, I'm running a 16 CPU cluster. Why this thing is not running? I have 16 CPUs. Let's look at that more. Now the default CPU request is 200M, and 200M is, think of it as a 0.2 CPU, and in terms of a vCPU, if you think of in terms of AWS or any other cloud provider, and none on memory. So if you create a pod and you say, describe the pod to me, and then it'll show you the request is 200M and nothing on CPU and no limit, okay? So if I need 16 CPUs and I am running a 16 CPU cluster, why those 16 CPUs are not available to me? Now, the way I can look at that is I can give a command called as kubectl top nodes. And if I give that command, it shows me sort of the memory CPU utilization on my cluster, okay? So I wanna give that command, but it says, oh, the service is not available. So the service is currently unable to handle the request, get nodes metrics Kate's API. Now, this is an API which gathers all the data from nodes and um, it gathers all the data, it used to be Heapster, but now it's more Prometheus. So it gathers all the data from um, your node and it publishes it and that's where the data is being generated. So what's really missing for me in this case is really a metric server. And again, this is a very standard uh, upstream Kubernetes tool. So what you can do is you can install the Kubernetes uh, metric server over here. Uh, just literally clone the repo and in the 1.8 plus directory, there are a bunch of deployment files go ahead, deploy them to your cluster, and once you deploy that, then your service is up, or at least the API is available. And you can verify that your metrics API is available, so you just say get API service, give it a number, and he says, yep, looking good, available, and running for a while. Now, when I say kubectl top nodes, I'm getting the right data. So it's reporting the cores, the CPU, so it says, yeah, you're running about, you're using about 28M, so about 0 0.028 uh, is what you're utilizing. 0% uh, is being utilized, um, and it's using about 410 megabytes of memory, so about 2% of memory for all of the 16 gigabyte that I have available, okay? Now remember, all of 16, gigab 16 CPUs are not available to you. That's an important part of the thing. You are running a 16 CPU cluster, but certain amount of memory is required to run kubelet and certain amount of memory is run to run the operating system daemon, the CRI, and all those things. So all of 16 CPU is not available. Let's look into that then. There is a concept of capacity memory and an allocatable memory. So the capacity, 
Yeah. No, top nodes is top nodes is only for the nodes itself. Repeat the question, please. Yeah, the question is the top nodes command is this using the request and the limit. No, it's not. Top nodes is just saying that how much memory and CPU is available for the nodes. The actual Correct. And so now what I'm saying is there's a concept of a capacity memory and an allocatable memory. The capacity memory is basically how much capacity is available. And allocatable memory is, sure, you have a capacity of 16 gigabyte, but certain amount of memory is already being used for kubelet and other processes. So I want to make sure that I'm giving you only the allocatable memory. And you can see there's a bit of a difference here. Here is about 1595 and here is 1584. So whatever that delta is, is being used for kubelet, okay? The way allocatable is calculated, as a matter of fact, you of course look at the node capacity. So you remove cube reserved memory, you know, whatever is required by the kubelet essentially. You remove the system reserved memory, and you can also set up the hard eviction threshold memory, which is the memory which, you know, at which point you know, it will start ejecting parts you know, because it knows it's right off the threshold, essentially. So um, uh, one of the key concepts is this is explained at node allocatable, so it's worth reading on how all this thing works, the allocatable and the capacity memory, because that is a fundamental part on how you're designing your cluster. Okay? So now let's take a look at it. When I do the same thing for capacity and allocatable, the numbers don't change. It says the CPUs are four and four. If four is allocatable, why? That means I have 16 CPUs, why I'm not able to allocate it, okay? Now, yes, allocatable should be calculated that way, but when you're creating the cluster at that point of time, you as a cluster operator, cluster designer, has to specifically say, oh, carve out this memory for kubelet reserve. And then it says, I'm gonna, yeah, because you are asking, now I'm going to take that into consideration of calculating the allocatable part of it. Okay? So uh, one of the things that we've done recently, and this was literally done about two weeks ago, um, when using EKS, now when you're creating a Kubernetes cluster, we allow you to set those values, eviction hard and cube reserved, basically, those two values. So those are set in the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And that is a clear indication that, okay, this is the amount of CPU and the memory that is available. So those are allocated for system processes. Um, so now it's evident that, hey, we don't have enough CPUs. So what we need to do is set up a cluster autoscaler. Cluster autoscaler is, again, an upstream component. It serves two purposes. It basically makes sure that if any parts that are failing due to insufficient resources, then it will just scale the cluster for you. And then it will also recycle nodes that are underutilized for an extended period of time. So let's say you have a 10-node cluster, and it recognizes that, hey, by the way, all the nodes are running about 20% of CPU. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pods are stateless. I'm going to move them to a different node, and I'm going to recycle those pods. I want to make sure that your cluster size is optimal. So what we're going to do is we're going to install it. And again, for installing it, we need to set up certain IAM policies attach the policy to the IAM role. Um, we on the auto scaling group, which are behind the scene for us. Now this is what is connected to. So cluster auto scaler is a Kubernetes concept, but end of the day, they need to talk to auto scaling group because that's where the in AWS language where your cluster is scaled. So you need to make sure that you set up the correct uh, tags over there. And these are Kate's IO tag. So once you set up those tags on the auto scaling group, that means the auto scaling group can be automatically discovered by your cluster auto scaler. Now you create the cluster autoscaler. So you essentially need a certificate file. Um, then you create the cluster autoscaler here. Okay. I need to look at it that, okay, um, now I can look at my cluster autoscaler logs, essentially. And if I look at my autoscaler logs, yeah, the parts of the cluster autoscaler are running. But it says it's skipping node group over here because it says the max size has reached. Sure, I've installed the cluster autoscaler, but as I said, the cluster autoscalers behind the scene talk to autoscaling group. So the next thing that we need to do really is update our autoscaling group limits. So we go to our autoscaling group, and to the autoscaling itself, I say, oh, by the way, change my max size to eight. So now I can set up my autoscaling group to be eight. One thing to understand over here is the cluster autoscaler is being reactive in the sense that it looks at, oh, by the way, the pods are not being scheduled, and now I need to scale it. You can actually use auto-scaling group, use the auto-scaling group policies to being proactive. 
in which you can set up in the auto scaling group that, hey, you know, if the CPU utilization goes above 50%, automatically scale my cluster and add more nodes to it. So you can use a combination of the two to make sure you know, your pods are always like, you know, your cluster is an optimal size and your pods can always be scheduled. So now, essentially, if I um, run my kubectl get pods, you know, cluster is scaled, auto scaling group is set, and all my pods are running basically at this point of time. Um, similar use case, I was running a, a machine learning workload on this Kubernetes cluster over there using Kubeflow. And I saw that, hey, MNIST inference, I'm running an inference task here, and I say zero of one ready, pending, and uh, let's describe this part a bit more, and as I describe it, it says, all right, you know, insufficient um, NVIDIA GPU available to me. So essentially, my um, solution for that is set up my cluster autoscaler, use the autoscaling group to look at that metrics and say, you know what, scale my cluster, and that way it can solve that problem. Awesome. So, so now we have very easily created a cluster. It was super simple, right? We didn't run into any problems because we read the documentation first. But now you have a, a pod, a Hello World deployment running, and we want to show the rest of the world how cool uh, it is and how you know, the amazing fonts that we've used and the cat pictures that we've used. We want to show it to the rest of the world. So a uh, couple of things you can do is uh, you can use uh, two either the service to expose your pods to the rest of the world, uh, so then it will be accessible from outside your EKS cluster, or you can use the ingress object. So if you just do service type load balancer, if you just say expose uh, uh, my service, then it's going to by default uh, install, create a, a classic load balancer. We have three types of load balancer, network load balancer, which is layer four, classic does four and seven, and then application load balancer that does layer seven. So if you, buy, if you just say service type load balancer in your service, then you're going to get a classic load balancer. If you wanted to use a newer network load balancer, then you, all you have to do is annotate your service with just uh, load balancer type NLB, and uh, EKS is going to provision an NLB in the back end. Now, you don't have to be using EKS for that. You could just be running Kubernetes on AWS, and, and then that should work as well. The second option, uh, if you're operating in microservices environment, is to use ALB ingress controller, and it creates an ingress resource inside your cluster, and then you can basically say, uh, when you get traffic on slash front end, send, send the traffic to this particular service that's running front end. And when you get the traffic on slash back end, send this to another set of service, and eventually to the pods that are running the back end service. So um, you can use ALB ingress controller. You just install the controller inside. We'll provision an ALB on your behalf in your account. Um, and that's it. Then you start uh, creating your ingress rules, and you can start serving traffic. In addition to ALB ingress controller, you, there are a bunch of uh, open source and commercial um, ingress, ingresses out there. Um, the most popular one that I've come across is Nginx. So that uh, really works really well. But it doesn't mean that you're you know, creating services. You, know, you get the theme, right? We're not going to just say create load balancer and automatically it's going to happen because we're the worst users. Of course, it will fail. So when it fails, if your load balancer is not provisioning, the first thing I would do is get check tags. So there are, if you go into documentation, hidden in very deep inside our documentation is this really important tag that you should put in your subnets, otherwise your load balancer is not going to work. So make sure that you, uh, you have those tags in your, uh, in your subnet. Um, if, you still, if you have the load balancer enabled and you're still, it's still not working, then the next step would be to go check uh, your service and check the events, check the status. Sometimes it will say load balancer provisioning failed, and it can give you some um, interesting idea of what to do next. Um, the last thing I would check is the EKS service IAM role. So remember I said when you say service type load balancer, EKS is going to provision a load balancer in your account. This role gives us the, gives us the ability to do that. If you don't have this role, then we basically don't have the ability to come in your account and start a, uh, create a load balancer. So make sure you give that permission to us. Now, if you have your load balancer, it gets provisioned. Uh, don't think that you're not going to run into some problems there. So the most common problems that I face is you know, everything works, but my application is slow. And this is without Kremlin's chaos engineering. This is just my hello world. It, you know, this cannot be chaos engineered. Uh, I thrive in chaos. So 
First thing you should do, very easy to do, is enable logging inside your load balancers. It's very easy to do. It's a checkbox. If you're lazy like me, go in the console, enable it. That will give you some of the metrics like latency and application metrics like 4xx, 5xx errors. And those are helpful. You can see if, if there's a high error rate in your application. That could be the reason why it is, um, it's, your request is slow or failing. If you see that there's, everything is good inside your, uh, at your in your load balancer front, the next thing I would do is start a pod inside your, inside your Kubernetes cluster and access the service right there and see what the metrics are. So you can create a shell demo uh, pod and it basically gives, drops you into a Debian Ubuntu-like environment where you can install some really good troubleshooting tools like curl. Um, and you can curl directly the IP or the fully qualified domain name and you can see what it really is that, that's causing problems. So a lot of times you'll see that the application is slow either because um, your pods are spread out too wide, and nodes have latency in between them, and this is a good tool to help you identify. Now another thing that you can do is when you create a service, you're also getting endpoints, so you can also try to ping the endpoints and see if one particular endpoint is, is creating problems and the rest are fine. And lastly, um, if you, if, you, if, you want, if you can change your app, definitely implement tracing in your application. Microservices without tracing is super hard to do because you're basically, the request could be coming in from one app and traversing through 12 different apps and then giving the result back. So if you have latency in one of the app, in the 12 apps that you have, you can't see that unless you have some kind of tracing ability. And traditionally tracing has been really hard to, to implement. But if you're using a service mesh, tracing becomes really easy. And I would highly recommend you use uh, some kind of tracing solution with service mesh, whether it's uh, Jaeger or Open Tracing with Istio or X-Ray with uh, App Mesh. Definitely use it because it's low effort and it will give you the ability to look at that request and see where it's failing or what is the, the, what's causing the slowness in your environment. So clearly, networking, really, really important uh, uh, monitoring that really, really important piece that you cannot skip if you have to run um, a successful Kubernetes cluster. So that you ask a question like, okay, it seems like Kubernetes has these millions of resources. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's billions of resources. What should I really monitor? Um, and that becomes a problem because it's too much to monitor and there's too much data causes too much confusion. You don't really know, should I be paying attention to this API latency metrics or this resync interval, what is, what is it really? So we've tried to simplify it for you. Um, you can of course monitor everything and you should monitor everything, but you don't have to pay attention to every metric. Some of the key things that you want to monitor are your worker nodes. Clearly they're running your, worker, your application, so make sure that they're running healthy. Then it's going to be a cluster components like ingress controllers, dashboards, tools for monitoring, cluster autoscaler, all of those things. And then finally, the apps. So some of the metrics that we recommend that you monitor uh, to begin with, on the nodes, definitely have CPU network memory. That's the basic. Uh, cluster components, etcd is something you should monitor if you're not running EKS, because if, if, if you are using EKS, that's our responsibility. Amazon will make sure that your etcd cluster is healthy and up and running all the time. But if you're running your own cluster, Highly recommend it, because if your etcd cluster goes, it dies, and then we'll say goodbye to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Add-ons, really important. Um, monitor the monitoring tools, and then have monitoring tools monitor them. Um, we must go level deeper, so if you have monitoring tools or ingress controllers, load balancers, dashboards, make sure you monitor the, the, those components as well. And then the last part is your application. You definitely want to capture metrics that are relevant to your particular workload um, and any of the error rates, like if you're running a web-based application, 5xx, 4xx. So how do you monitor? Well, the, the simplest answer today in Kubernetes world is Prometheus with Grafana. Everybody loves it. It's super easy to set up. There, is a, there are tons of community support. Um, and so that's the de facto tool. A couple of months ago, we also launched uh, CloudWatch Container Insights. This is um, an, a really easy to use tool that you can install inside your cluster. And we have pre-built dashboards that can give you a lot of details on your cluster or your node, your pod level. And uh, 
there's certainly Kubernetes dashboard. You can use that, although I'll stop there. Um, then there are commercial solutions, bunch of them. Um, Dynatrace, Datadog, Sysdig are just some of them. They, they can provide you some really cool functionalities, like some of them have machine learning that can predict problems before they actually happen. Um, let's start looking at, uh, let's look at Prometheus. So Prometheus, again, is very easy to install. It comes with a Helm chart. So I will, here I'll just create a Prometheus namespace, and I'll say Helm install Prometheus. Now, I, I do want to customize some of the values for Helm chart. And over here, I'm going to say that I want to persist the data. If you don't do that, basically you're getting ephemeral pod, which if it just gets destroyed, all of your metric data will be lost. So you don't want to do that. Um, you definitely want to persist that data. So I've created a storage class that's backed by EBS, that's Elastic Block Storage. And over here, I'm using a GP2 type volume uh, that I created before, and I'm saying, Prometheus, please store your data um, into this volume. And then also I'm saying for Alert Manager, which is a component of Prometheus, I'm saying you also please go ahead and persist your data. Uh, next thing I want to do is once I create the, the deploy the hunt chart, it's going to create a bunch of tools, uh, a bunch of pods inside my cluster. Uh, you'd see that I'm running a three node cluster here, and for each cluster, uh, for each worker node, you'll see a node exporter here, and then you'll see Prometheus uh, server, uh, alert manager, and state persistent uh, pods. So basically, that's what you get when you install Prometheus. Uh, if you want to check Prometheus, you, ca you can just do a kubectl port forward, which is going to open a port on your local host. And if you go localhost port 8080, you will get Prometheus um, dashboard. Um, it's not really helpful. But you know, Prometheus is not supposed to give you information uh, firsthand. So if you want to see nice, pretty graphs that, that are pleasing to look at and um, you know, make errors look better, then highly recommended that you install Grafana on top of it. So again, Grafana, you can use Helm chart to install Grafana in your, um, in your cluster. You don't have to create a namespace for Grafana. A lot of people will just put this with kubesystem or Prometheus namespace. Uh, but if you want to, you can. Again, I'm here saying um, that I want to persist my data on a GP2 storage class, just like I did with Prometheus. And then I'm, uh, I'm saying that I also want the service type to be load balancer. So in this situation, what I don't want, like uh, Prometheus, I don't want to go and every time say kubectl proxy uh, or kubectl to open a, a port on my laptop. Sometimes I may want to just access my cluster state outside my network or not from my laptop where I don't have kubectl. So over here, when we say service type load balancer, it's actually going to provision a classic load balancer in the backend that we can just go, stable URL, we don't have to expose any ports, no dependency on kubectl, and access Grafana dashboard. So again, once I cre uh, deploy the Helm chart, uh, you get a one pod, um, and that does everything. And next thing I want to do is I want to I want to get the URL. So I'll you just uh, query the, the uh, Grafana service and just get the load balancer address, which is going to give you the ELB um, URL, and then you just get the the password, and then you get the dashboard. Now, when you go to Grafana dashboard, it's not going to look anything like this. It's going to be very basic. You can create your own dashboards. We recommend it, but you probably just want to use a community-driven one. And for because Grafana is not a Kubernetes-specific thing, they have Redis dashboards and they have Cassandra dashboard. You can just go and uh, use some of the uh, community-created dashboards. So over here, we're looking at community dashboard 3131. Very easy, if you go to Grafana, you'll just say import, and you put in a number, and you get this dashboard. You don't have to do anything. Uh, another dashboard that's useful, so 3131 is a cluster level. It gives you pods, and uh, it gives you nodes and cluster level details. 3146 gives you pod level details. So some, and there are a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, dashboards out there that you can utilize inside your cluster. So you don't have to do any, you don't, there's no learning curve with Grafana. You, can, you don't have to know how to create a dashboard. Just get the number and use it in your cluster. Some of the important log files that you should also look at are uh, going to be on node logs, your Kubernetes uh, control plane logs, scheduler logs, audit logs. These are really helpful if you are in, a, in an environment where you need to go back in time and tell what happened, or you, they're really helpful in troubleshooting. So 
highly recommend that you keep these logs. You, can, uh, you don't have to store them forever, but you know, as long as you have to go back for troubleshooting, those are good enough. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the container, uh, CloudWatch Container Insights. So CloudWatch team has built this really nice tool that they think that will help a lot of customers. Traditionally, installing dashboards has been a, a little bit of pain point, and then learning how to use that dashboard effectively in your organization is another feat. So we wanted to solve those two challenges, make it easier for you to collect, summarize metrics, and then consume metrics at the same time. So if you use CloudWatch, it's really easy to use. You get some dashboards that are already built, and all you have to do is just go there and monitor, and then you can uh, put in alerting and trigger, send a Slack message, uh, all those things. So it, we, we use CloudWatch, but on the cluster itself, it's leveraging FluentD, which means that all the logs inside your cluster, assuming they're all sent to standard out, are collected by FluentD, and then FluentD pipes or sends those logs to CloudWatch. Um, CloudWatch is no, not the only destination that FluentD supports, so in future, if you'd like to say, I don't like CloudWatch, I want to go to Elasticsearch, all you have to do is in, that, in FluentD configuration, you're going to say, um, now start sending cloud, logs to, cloud, uh, to Elasticsearch, and that's it. You don't have to rip out your entire infrastructure there. So in order to deploy uh, CloudWatch container in site, all you have to do is um, you'll import a YAML uh, that we provide, and it's going to create two daemon sets. One is going to be the FluentD daemon set, and the second one is going to be the CloudWatch agent daemon set. And that's it. Once you do that, next thing, you open your CloudWatch um, dashboard, and you can, you can see this. And that's just the one type of uh, dashboard that we have. We have created custom dashboards, and, the, and we spoke with customers like you, and they said, what would you like to see as, as a first thing? And a lot of customers said, we need cluster level details. But I also want to be able to see my thing, my pods, my namespaces. I want to see my services. And I want to be able to dig deeper into that cluster. So for, for that, we've created a bunch of dashboards that will satisfy most of the needs out there. And you also have the ability to create your custom dashboards if you want to. Another thing it does is uh, logs. So along with metrics that CloudWatch is collecting, there are also logs that CloudWatch can take. So again, we're using FluentD, send those logs. Those are stored durably in CloudWatch. So again, you're not storing them uh, in another location. Those are stored in CloudWatch. And then you can use CloudWatch logs inside queries and then query those logs without having to provision any C2 instance or any hardware. So for example, if I wanted to see what is the memory usage across my cluster, but I don't want to log into kubectl, I can just run this query on my logs, and it will tell me what is the current state of my cluster. So there you go, without provisioning an EC2 instance, without provisioning any hardware, you can query your logs very, very easily. So if you're, if you're, if you're running an application, if you're creating a microservices environment, Monitoring and logging are really, really important. A good cloud-native application is not only just the one that runs well, but also is, it's also reporting what is happening. You don't want to be running a black box. You want to see what is running, what are the metrics, how is the application running, is it failing or not. So for that, there are certain things that you should do. First of all, probes. Make sure you use probes as default. Make sure you have liveness and readiness probe as a standard across your organization because they're really helpful. Uh, you don't want to be running into situations like your pod comes up and it's, uh, it's not functional for five minutes and then your cluster is getting auto-scaled to millions of pods because you did not have a readiness, readiness probe. Uh, so make sure you have them. Implement tracing. Use service mesh. Use X-ray, open tracing, whatever is a tool you love. And then also monitor process health and logs. So don't just, uh, don't just assume that because you have FluentD and CloudWatch that all the logs are magically going to appear in CloudWatch. Make sure that all the components that you are running, for example, if you're running a, a Python app that uses Nginx, make sure you're capturing both Python logs, Flask logs, and Nginx logs. So make sure your, all the logs are being collected, not just your app, but also the supporting apps that you may have. Next is you. <clears throat> we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier already you know, in terms of um, how do you do resource reservation. So um, 
you can monitor the kubelet on the worker node. So let's say you have done the resource reservation. Um, you can dig into your worker node. So if you create your Kubernetes cluster, and let's say you have SSH key enabled over there, then get into your Kubernetes cluster and say, give me the details for a particular worker node. And this is the way, the way you're getting it. And um, we talked about this earlier already, how you can use cube reserved and system reserved memory to how this value can be set up. And not only you can do this, like if you're running an EKS cluster, of course you can use EKS cuttle over there, but let's say you're creating you know, a Kubernetes cluster you know, using some other tool. So COPS has these capabilities as well. Um, or if you're creating using uh, army, then in the army there is a concept of a user data. And in the user data, for example, you can specify these commands as part of your commands to the API server, and then you can say that make sure my resources are appropriately allocated. So if you look at it over here, for example, we are highlighting that how you can set up that value in the EKS cuddle. And this is only specific to Amazon EKS, essentially. So that's one of the areas where we're talking about. So how you can have system reserved, cube reserved, and eviction reserved. Because those are the three values that are taken into consideration when it's looking at capacity and actually reporting the right value of allocatable. So that, yes, you know, it will not be able to schedule your parts, but it want, you want it to report the right value as well for CPU. Okay. If you're doing, um, uh, we have seen a lot of customers who are doing oversubscription, uh, where they say, you know what, yeah, sure, you know, um, CPU is not a compressible resource, but memory is a compressible resource, so I'm going to oversubscribe it. So um, one of the things that we recommend to our customers is to avoid oversubscription, to specify sort of your CPU and the memory limits over there. And uh, in this case, for example, you can see that the, mem the request is 64 megabyte uh, for the memory, and 128 megabyte is the limit. So that way you can totally calculating on how much max that the, the, each worker node should be able to handle. Um, another option over there, another opinion over there is to be able to specify your uh, resource quotas on namespaces. So in this case, I'm just saying that for this namespace, you know, depending upon your dev and the testing and the prod and the staging namespaces, if that's how you are achieving multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, set up your limits over there. And it's not just for um, CPU, as a matter of fact. You can set it for CPU, the total amount of compute resources, the total amount of resources, how many services, how many parts can be created in this namespace. So once you start specifying that, then those, and there are inheritance rules available that if your part spec does not specify any resource and limits, that it inherits that from the namespace itself. Now, once the namespace, once the quota on the namespace is full, of course, you know, it's treated as the same way that, hey, you know, you have no, no longer have any more resources. So then your cluster is not the scope. Now your namespace is the scope. So then you want to look at it that, okay, the error messages fortunately are much better here. It says exceeded quota, and it'll tell you exactly what quota is exceeded. And then you start debugging it, then you have got to go back to your cluster operator that increase my namespace limit or give me a different namespace or a different cluster so that you can start debugging what's the problem over there. Now, by default, containers run with unbounded compute resources um, on a Kubernetes cluster or in a namespace resource quota. So limit range is a policy uh, to constrain resource by pod or container in a namespace. So in this case, for example, I'm creating a limit range, and I'm saying that uh, by default, if the pod has no spec, like no resource, um, no memory or CPU specified over there, this is the memory that they're going to inherit. So that way you can start, sorry, my, this is the memory and the CPU limits that they're going to inherit, basically. So that kind of gives you an idea that, you know, how you can start sizing your cluster, because cluster sizing is really important, you know, you don't want it to grow um, arbitrarily large. So now what you're doing is you're just saying kubectl describe limit ranges, and then you can start getting those values, and that kind of gives you an idea that, you know, why your cluster may not really be getting created. So from your perspective, you're just saying kubectl create deployment, and then you have to recognize that, hey, is there a namespace limit? Is there a limit range defined for me? So then you have to start looking at those objects and their default values, kind of the reason that the pod may not really getting deployed. Um, I'm not going to dig in deeper into this, but essentially the idea is if there are rules, if limits and requests are defined, on the pod and on the limit ranges and how they really work. 
but the whole idea is that if nothing is defined on the part, then they inherit from the limit ranges. That's sort of the key rule over here. But once again, the key part being, if your part is not getting deployed, if your part is not coming up, there are things possibly going at multiple levels. You know, it could be limit range, could be namespace coda, could be uh, cluster autoscaler. We haven't even talked about, as a matter of fact, about horizontal power autoscaler. And that is one thing that can help you really with, um, with the service latency, which um, Ray kind of touched upon it briefly. All right, story time. Um, so I'm very proud of creating my Hello World application, but I also created another application where I can store, store all my important data and pictures. So I took the, my, my kids' uh, birth pictures and baby pictures and stored it all in a Kubernetes pod, right? It's awesome. And then the pod obviously got deleted. So guess what happens to all my data? Anyone, any guesses? The data was gone, yeah? I was kidding, it was not my baby pictures, it was my wedding pictures. Much worse, trust me. So, pods are ephemeral by nature. Do not store your wedding pictures, do not store your tax documents <laughs> in pods, unless you are using stateful sets, then you can do it. So, stateful sets allow you to persist data using a storage backend that, again, is abstracted away from the developers and users. You don't need to, be, you don't need to care as a developer what storage backend should I use? Those are all done by, hopefully, an administrator. If you're the administrator, then it's you. You should do it your job. Um, so stateful sets allow you to persist that data on a, on, a, on a backend. And if a container, if a pod fails, then the data is persisted, and a new stateful set container would come up, pod will come up, and start using that data. So you don't lose any data. So stateful sets are really providing pods with that persistent storage to persist data. Um, they also create a persistent volume claim uh, automatically on the fly. And the reason why stateful sets are so different from deployments and pods are because uh, they're, they are, each pod is going to get its dedicated uh, PVC, which means that it's not sharing that volume with any other pod. It will have its own dedicated PVC. It also creates a headless service. And what headless service really does is it gives each, each uh, pod that's part of that service a unique IP address. So if you're running, let's say, Redis master and Redis slave, you can really easily identify the ordinalities. So like one would be the master, second would be the slave, and so on. And that ordering is maintained by, by Kubernetes. So if your pod or your, your node fails, if multiple nodes fail, when the new pods come up, they, will, they are going to come up in that same order. So it's kind of a, a little bit more resiliency that you can put uh, when you're working with stateful sets, which is really necessary if you're dealing with databases. For example, you may have a MySQL master database and a bunch of slaves. This is going to make sure that you're always replicating uh, from master to slave and not otherwise. So on EKS, uh, there are a bunch of options. Some of them I want to highlight here are the um, EBS and EFS CSI drivers. Now, CSI is a container storage interface. It's much like networking, where you, don't, where you can pick your own network uh, provider. Um, you can use Amazon VPC CNI, or you can use Flannel. Similarly, for storage, you don't have to use the same kind of storage provider. You could use EBS, you could use EFS. There are a bunch of third-party providers out there that you can also use. Again, they're, they're, they, what they conform to is the CSI spec. And all of them provide the, the basic functionality, which is providing a volume. And then you have a bunch of additional functionality, like snapshotting, et cetera. So if you are running databases, if you're running uh, pods that need to persist data, make sure you're running stateful sets. Don't delete your wedding pictures. Uh, make sure you're reusing um, uh, one of these CSI uh, providers. Now, a few generations ago in Kubernetes, there was an entry uh, storage provider. Highly recommend that you don't use that because that Kubernetes is moving away from it. You want to use something that provides, uh, that's using CSI. So if you look at EKS, EBS is the most common, um, uh, most common storage type for customers that are running stateful sets in Kubernetes. Um, so you can use that with EKS or you can just use it with COPS. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but they will, they will provide that 
persistent storage for your pods. In EBS, uh, these are again the functionality, functions of a specific CSI type. So EBS CSI type supports both dynamic and um, static assignment of volumes, which means that either you can pre-create a volume in EBS and say use this volume to store all data, or you can say as a pod comes up, just dynamically create because I don't want to be managing volumes by myself. And you can also say that if the pod goes down, if the data is replicated, delete the data as well so you're not paying anything, any additional uh, for, for that pod that's not alive. Uh, these volumes can be resized, so you don't need to guess the capacity ahead of time. You can just increase from 10 to 20 GB if you wanted to. And they also support snapshots. So you can take a snapshot if you're not running a, a, a pod continuously, take a snapshot on EBS, kill the pod, there are two months later when you need it again, you can start a new volume and uh, hopefully save a little bit on cost. Uh, one important thing, really, really important thing with EBS is currently EBS is only available in, EBS volumes are only available in one availability zone, which means in a region like US West 2 where we have, I think, three availability zones, zones, if you create an EBS volume in availability zone one, it's not available in two and three. So if you're creating stateful sets or if you're giving your pods uh, a volume, uh, then make sure that you have some kind of logic that says this pod can only come up in this availability zone. And that's typically done using node labels. So make sure you don't run into a situation where your pod is now, was running in US, um, US West one and was using an EBS volume in that availability zone, it got deleted, and now it's running in West 2, waiting for that volume, which is never gonna arrive. So don't, don't run into that problem. Make sure you're using, you're binding your stateful sets, you make sure you're binding your pods that need storage to a particular availability zone. Now, if you wanted to, if you wanted your, your uh, pods across availability zones to share the same volume, use EFS. EFS is available across the region, so uh, it doesn't matter which AZ you sit in, all the volumes are replicated across. Um, so that's a really good use case uh, if, you, if you need that kind of distributed storage. Creating an EBS uh, storage class is really simple. Um, you will say provisioner, this is going to be AWS EBS, and over here you can provide some parameters. So here I'm saying give me a journal purpose uh, volume, and this is going to provision EBS volume based on this configuration here. And I don't have to go to EBS and say, give me a volume. I can just create everything in my Kubernetes cluster. And then when the pod needs an IP address, a, a volume, then storage class is automatically going to provision one, assuming that it's doing it dynamically, and attach that to the pod. So it becomes very seamless. You only need to create a storage class once. And then the developers can just request that storage class and request uh, volumes for their pods. So uh, one of the things that I, I, actually let me step back. I was trying to look for failure scenarios for storage, didn't really find much, which tells me either my Google searching is really bad or these CSI drivers work very well. I'm, proud of my Google searching skills. So that's definitely not it. So it looks like it's a lot more stable environment now, but there are certain things that you, you may run into. One of them is this, which is uh, you mount a volume and you now want to write, uh, write on it and uh, it fails. You know, often customers were gonna ask me and say, what if I do this uh, crazy thing in Kubernetes? Is it going to work? And my answer is in Spanish, C. Si. But in Spanish, C si also means if. So my, you know, they misunderstand me. They think I'm saying yes, which is C. But what I'm really meaning is if, if you read the documentation right, and if you do everything right and jump to 200 hoops, it's going to work. So this is one of those scenarios where you may mount a volume and you can't write to it. Um, the reason why it, it happens is because uh, if you're really interested, Google search pause containers, and they'll tell you a lot, give you a lot of reading to do. But all the volumes are mounted as by root user, essentially. So if you're not the root, you can't write. and Don't run your containers with root. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what you can do is you can either use the security contacts in the pod, which is going to uh, use Linux security contacts and is going to 
allow your containers, or Docker container in this case, to assume that uh, security contacts and start writing. Or um, another thing you can do is init containers. So a lot of people will say init container, which, is, which, runs, which you can run as root, mount the volume, and then um, uh, change the, uh, chain the permissions, which is run chown or chmod or something like that, to now give your other containers, which really need to write to the volumes, the ability to write to this EBS volume. So um, that's, those are the two things you can do. Uh, if you want to put security context, uh, basically this is what you need to do. Uh, there's a, a little bit further reading required here if you're not familiar with these two things. But if you're dealing with storage, then it's highly recommended um, that, you, that you implement this. If not, then init containers could be a rule. Now, init containers, not, they're not just for storage, but anytime you need something done before your application comes up, use, your, use init containers. You can use ordering there, and they're really helpful too. And that's it from my side. So um, this presentation is all available online. Now, this is the GitHub repo on the top where all the content source is available. And on the bottom is where, you know, I mean, we have been running a local version of it. But if you go to the bottom link, you can actually run this wherever you want to. So feel free to share, contribute. We would love to hear your stories on what happened to your part. Why did your part fail? And I think I'm going to write a thesis on that sometime. You, know, you could actually very easily write a story on this. Send a PR. Yeah, send a PR. You can um, edit this presentation yourself. Yeah, this is all in a GitHub repo. Uh, some of the links that we want to share here is the last link is what I want to really highlight. It's a simple link. Kates.af, K8S.af. This is a link of Kubernetes failure stories. You know, the multi-million ways your Kubernetes cluster can crash and burn. So we all learn from our failures far more. Uh, we, wanna, we have some books that we want to share, uh, some of the books that we like and you know, that are well used in the industry. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you.